Welcome to the second in a series of quirky town and village tours. The intention of this series is not to show you some of the well-known things you can see and do, but rather those things that are a little bit more unusual. Shrewsbury is a beautiful town with so much of interest to see and explore. Immortalised in A.E. Houseman's Shropshire Lad as islanded in Severn Stream and overlooked by the famous Shrewsbury School founded in 1552 that boasts alumni from Charles Darwin, Michael Palin of Monty Python fame and John Peel to the maker of this video. The town has a fascinating range of architecture with many stunning Tudor and late period buildings still in use as shops, hotels and pubs. It also hosts less attractive modern additions with some quite brutalist in their design. So, here are a few unusual things that you might have missed and are well worth looking out for. Many older viewers might remember Percy Thrower from their youth, who made regular appearances on the BBC's Blue Peter programme and was probably England's first celebrity gardener. He was appointed Park Superintendent in 1946 and in the Dingle you can see a memorial to him. He established a local market garden business well before the big names came to Shrewsbury. Whilst in the Dingle, have a look at the Shoemaker's Arbour, a Grade II listed structure that was moved to the Dingle in 1879 from Kingsland, exactly 200 years after its construction in 1679. The gate protecting it has some interesting features that any cobbler would recognise. It's well worth parking a bit out of town and walking in, as you'll see more of the town that way. If you come from the west, you'll cross the Welsh Bridge, a Grade 2 star listed structure. Designed and built in the late 1790s by local man John Carline. We'll hear more of him later. At the same time, you cannot fail to see the huge Quantum Leap sculpture built to mark the bicentenary of Darwin's birth and unveiled by his great-great-grandson in 2009. As you cross, have a look at the town end of the bridge. There, an inscription reads, Commit no nuisance. This is to remind you, and those gone by, not to urinate in public. Close to the town side of the bridge is an area that's been boarded up for many years. This was the site of a devastating gas explosion that killed and injured a number of people. A sad day back in January 2010, and it's yet to be redeveloped. The English Bridge serves as the eastern approach to the town and was opened by Queen Mary in 1927. Stonework for an older bridge which had houses on it is believed to still exist under the roadway of Wild Cop and also on the other side of the river too where the waterway was filled in. When you walk over have a look at the lion head carvings. Much debate has gone on about the heraldic symbols used in Shropshire and it seems to be generally agreed that the lion is in fact a leopard. I think this one looks more like a teddy bear. Another way to visit Shrewsbury is to come by train. You may well be signalled in by some of the few remaining semaphore signals that are still in use on the line. Take a look at the station building from outside, formerly known as Shrewsbury General, and see just how impressive the architecture is. Designed by a local man from Oswestry, it was meant to match that of the old Shrewsbury School building, which is now the library and is located just up the road. Speaking of stations, opposite Shrewsbury Abbey, and now a car park, is the site that used to be Shrewsbury Abbey Station. The Abbey itself is well known by many as the setting of Ellis Peter's brother Cadfal novels. The western part of the Abbey fell into disuse and much was demolished to make way for Thomas Telford's Hollyhead Road. What remains, sitting out on its own, is the early 14th century refectory pulpit which looks rather sad and forgotten and is described as a precious survival by Pevsner. I have no idea when it hosted its last sermon and debate continues about whether it's in its original site or whether it was moved to its current location. 
In the graveyard is a large stone structure that can only be described as a giant dustbin lid. In my opinion, a quite hideous design that does not sit well at all with the rest of the architecture surrounding it. This is a memorial to Wilfred Owen, the war poet, who was killed one week before the armistice, whose mother received the sad news on Armistice Day. He died whilst crossing over a canal in North France, and the monument is fashioned on one of the pontoon bridges that we used to do this. The inscription from his 1918 poem, Strange Meeting, is particularly poignant considering how he was to die. Next to the Abbey is the beautiful Hospital of the Holy Cross, which professes to be for the residents of poor women aged 55 years or over who profess the Christian faith in accordance with the principles of one of the Protestant denominations. Just around the corner from the Abbey, on Holywell Street, is Observer House, a single-storey building set off the road that looks rather incongruous with its thick walls and small windows. Its name hints at its previous use. During the Cold War, this was the site of a Royal Observer Corps bunker. Opened in January 1962, had nuclear war broken out, it would have been from here that a few survivors could survey the damage and report back their findings. And this video would never have been made. Fortunately, the atomic bombs never came, and it's now repurposed as a veterinary surgery. Do go in as there's a small museum in the waiting room with some interesting artefacts from the time when it was an ROC site. Just up Abbey Foregate is Cold Bath Court that supposedly gets its name from where the Abbey's monks used to bathe. Next door is the wide archway of Cannock House. It's worth having a look through to see some of the road and rail memorabilia that can still be seen there. A number of blocked up windows or Pitt's portraits can be seen on nearby buildings, as well as others in and around Shrewsbury. A way of reducing one's liability to the window tax, a forerunner of the equally unpopular bedroom tax of 2012. Rather than just bricking them up, some of the best examples have false frames and glass painted onto the blacked out window. This is an example on a building close to Shrewsbury's Roman Catholic Cathedral. A number of buildings still sport a small plaque, usually consisting of three lion's heads and the word salop. In the 18th century, fire insurance marks were to indicate that the building's owners had paid for fire insurance with a specific company. And without it, the building could theoretically be left to burn. Look up as you walk around and you'll see a number of these around the town. It's interesting to note that the name salop an old name for Shropshire, was replaced after a campaign by John Kenyon, a local councillor to Shropshire, perhaps due to fears that the French might lose something in its translation. All over Shrewsbury, old street signs survive, ranging from those that are enamelled to ones that have embossed lettering, and signs that are cast as one piece. These range in date and the variety of styles is worth looking out for, as they add a charm all of their own to the streetscape. Tucked away at the abbey end of the English bridge is the pretty abbey gardens, a peaceful and tranquil spot to rest a while. Here you will find what is probably a small font thought to be of Norman origin as well as a stone arm. Also in the garden wall below is an assortment of stone carvings which give you a real sense of how large these items are when up on buildings. They're not just here by chance, but this was the site of John Carline's stone yard and they must have come from many different buildings which are no longer standing. As mentioned before, Carline played a major part in the building of the Welsh Bridge and whose father was a mason on the English Bridge. Shrewsbury boasts lots of narrow lanes or shuts, allowing one to shoot through from one street to another. It was medieval practice to name streets after their function and Shrewsbury boasts a fantastic example in the form of Grope Lane a reference to the prostitution that used to take place there just off the Market Square. Its full name is not suitable for this video, but at least it's not been totally badlerised into Grape Lane that you now find in more prudish locations. Some narrow shuts have been hemmed in by development, 
and the aptly named 70 Steps, which leads down to the river, is an example of one that needs real courage to venture up or down, even in the daylight hours. Above the Quarry Park, on a prominent spot, sits St Chad's Church, where Charles Darwin was baptised. It's said that due to a misunderstanding between the architect and the parish council, it ended up being built with a circular nave. The gallery is held up on iron columns cast by a local ironmaster, William Hazeldine, who worked closely with Thomas Telford on a number of projects, and who also cast the metalwork for the Ditherington Flax Mill, probably the first iron frame building in the world and the forerunner of most modern skyscrapers, which is now undergoing restoration. St Chad's Graveyard is interesting for a number of reasons. The iron top tombs are worth looking at, and one very fitting one is to a local ironmonger who died at the young age of 25. There's also a small bollard, which on further inspection warns of the well below. Not a good place to start digging a grave. In the graveyard, you'll also find a memorial stone to Ebenezer Scrooge. The inscription was carved for the 1984 version of Dickens's Christmas Carol, that was being filmed in Shrewsbury, which included many local people as extras. I remember being asked at the time and not taking any interest in the offer. It appears to be on an original gravestone, as there is faint writing still on it, though I'm not sure if this writing has been worn down by people walking onto it to inspect and take photographs of the Scrooge inscription, or if it was in this state before the more modern edition. Many places claim the first flight by a human, but St Mary's Church has a claim all of its own. Look at the plaque embedded in the wall by the west door, which makes for an interesting read. In 1739, Robert Cadman strung a line from the spire across the Severn and flew down it. He was a tightrope walker, so visions of him on a death slide are almost correct, as he did indeed die in the process. My father took great pleasure in showing me this as a child, possibly because he was a glider pilot, or more likely for its poetic script. In the market square is the beautiful old market hall. On one of the walls you'll find carved into the stone a grid of 10 by 5 holes. Many believe it's a medieval abacus, though strangely using the decimal system. I feel its use, though unknown, may be rather more prosaic. Venture down Carnarvon Lane and you'll find a number of glazed tiles set into the wall. This is part of the Wakeman Trail, a project done by local school children. Mike Griffiths, an art teacher, came up with the idea. He commented that when he asked pupils what they'd seen on their way to school, they said nothing. He recommended that they looked up sound advice if one wants to see what might be missed by many in a town or a city. It's still possible to walk along part of the old town walls, and it's worth having a look at the delightful 13th century Wingfields Tower, a grade two star listed building. Next to the tower is the Crescent, and just to the left of the buildings is a drinking fountain with a large lion's head on it, and the wonderful reminder used frequently by my father when I was a child, waste not, want not. Still wise words today, though there's no waste here, as the drinking fountain no longer works. A bit further along the town walls is the Roman Catholic Cathedral. The original plan was for Augustus Pugin, architect of many Gothic revival buildings, including the Palace of Westminster, to design it. But on both his death and that of John Talbot, the Earl of Shrewsbury who commissioned it, the project was passed to Edward, Pugin's son, to design the building. After finding a sand layer close to the foundations, the plan for a large steeple had to be cut back. There was to be no Leaning Tower of Shrewsbury to encourage tourists to visit. Shrewsbury has so much to offer, and a single day's visit would never do it justice. I hope you found this brief tour interesting, and let me know in the comments below how you got on when you visit. Enjoy this great town, and Floriat Salopia. <laughs>